Добредојдете на нашиот прв настан во 2021 година. Повторно на тема трансформација кон енергетска демократија, но овој пат со малку малку поразлични гости можеби. Професорот Стефан Бужаровски од Манчестер повторно е со нас и се надавам и во наредниот период на сите проекти и на сите евенти кои ни се придружува вака. А исто така овде е повторно Мелани од зелената европска зелената енергетска задруга од Загреб. Здраво Мелани и се разбира во како како регионално, значи го поканивме исто така и Стеван Војасинович од Рес Фаундејшн од Белград и мислам дека со ова заокружуваме како да кажам еден круг на говорници кои би го фатил и целиот регион и се разбира значи да да разговараме на истава тема од аспект на Европска унија и на регионот Западен Балкан и Хрватска Сега би сакал само да ве, да ве поканам да се извинувам. Сега би сакал да го поканам професор Стефан Бужаровски да ја почне својата презентација. Поверете, професоре. Благодарам и многу за поканата и благодарам исто така за можноста да се разговара на оваа тема. Јас ќе држам презентацијата на англиски, се радевам тоа е во ред и поради преведувањето и се, така што остатокот е на англиски, ако е тоа окей. И ќе ја сакам моја скрин, за да ја видите моја презентација. Така е само тоа, да ја го. И надавам се, ќе 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 Very happy to be speaking about this, which I think is a very topical issue, just transitions. Uh, today we had um, a report come out uh, by the uh, Bankwatch Network focusing on uh, just uh, transitions in the Western Balkans. Um, so I think it's a very timely moment to be speaking about this, given that there is so much public attention about what's happening. So I'll talk about just transitions in the energy sector, which is kind of my area of work, and I hope that you will find find this interesting. It's just talking about what they are, um, what the challenges are. Uh, I will give some examples of good and bad practice as well, and um, come with a few, few conclusions that maybe we can use for our future work. Right, so maybe some of you know that the European Commission um, has recently announced a whole series of policies around uh, uh, what's termed the European Green Deal, and they are all around um, questions around just transition. So you have um, the pillar of social rights, you have the just transition mechanism, uh, you have uh, basically the um, just energy transition fund, etc. So a whole series of initiatives around this. Um, there also are similar initiatives uh, in uh, North America, in Canada, in uh, also in uh, the US, Australia, even I've seen some in South Africa. So um, this is now a global, global thing. Um, however, the history of what we call just uh, transitions is actually quite specific and it comes out of a very, very um, distinctive tradition. Uh, so I think uh, the globalization of just transitions right now is it's quite an unusual trend for those of us who have been working in this area for, for a while now. Uh, and I should say alongside just transitions, we also have just sustainabilities and just sustainabilities um, have not globalized in the same way that just transitions have which I think is also linked to the general, um, the generally the climate challenge as, as such. So um, where, where do just transitions come from? Well, um, if you think about the very origins of the term, it's, it's really something that came out of um, the trade union movement, um, mostly in North America, um, it came out of people um, who were worried about um, increasing environmental standards 
um, not just for energy, but also in the chemical sector and other industrial sectors. So they were worried about what might happen to their jobs, uh, to their um, livelihoods if um, new controls were introduced and therefore they would uh, be priced out in a way of the job market. So um, that, that's where some of the origins were. And, and so there was a kind of idea that you, you'd have a conflict between the red and the green, the red being the jobs, the green being the climate agenda. And just uh, transitions is a way of, came out of that as a way of reconciling those two priorities. Um, now, in the meantime, there's been a lot more work and, and interest in the question of, of, of just uh, transitions. So um, people have, for example, talked about, about how we can react to a, to a situation on the ground. So we can basically look at something that's happened, look at situ a situation where suddenly there's a closing of a mine or a, or a coal plant or something like that and try to do something about it or you could have proactive policies where you anticipate um, the fact that there will be major restructuring in the economy and that major restructuring is connected to um, environmental priorities and you, and you then have measures that anticipate those changes. Um, the other thing of course is now that it's connected to environmental and energy justice and we think about it as in, um, embedding equity, embedding social equal, equality priorities in the movement towards a low carbon society. And um, it's also about inclusive politics, about bringing in various stakeholders into, into the process. So not just kind of telling what people what's going to happen, a kind of diktat, but really thinking about what's happening on the ground and finding ways of engaging with stakeholders so as to bring forward, um, bring forth um, alter alternatives that work for everybody. Um, and what are, and then of course we've got the specific question of just transitions in the energy sector. And here again, we sort of think about them uh, as the movement of, towards um, sustainable energy sy systems, so cle cleaner energy systems, but bringing in social justice and equity at the same time. And equity is different from, from equality. Equity prioritizes the needs of the more vulnerable first. Um, and then we also talk about not necessarily transitions, but also transformations. So we tend to say, well, it's about um, not necessarily moving in one direction, but moving in many different directions, moving uh, towards a path that has many outcomes. But the key thing is that you um, need to develop enabling systems to move towards better futures and you intervene in the structural elements of the system. And one element of that is what we call low carbon urban initiatives. So sometimes really intervene, intervening in the urban fabric uh, in, in ways that um, can benefit both environmental and sustainable goals. And there are different ways in which these uh, low carbon initiatives work. Um, and uh, this is, um, I think it's uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, um, where you have um, wind turbines being put into inside an urban area with benefits for citizens um, and potentially some employment. Um, this is in Hong Kong where um, solar power installations benefit against citizens, uh, but also enhance the urban area or like in Germany, where you have mass retrofits of housing, again, benefiting everyone, everyone involved. Now, the kind of thing that we need to have in mind with transitions is that they create what we call displacements. So um, when, when you have a transition, you disrupt the system. So you change your energy supply, you change um, how um, the technological base of of your energy system in terms of transmission, you change how people consume energy. Um, and in that case, you have lots of involvement by cities, by regions, and they're not just places where transitions occur, but the actual governance of those cities and regions matters. So who, who is involved in those cities um, in terms of local authorities, companies, 
um, NGOs like yourselves all, all become involved in the process. Uh, one big challenge is how, when you have a small scale transition experiment, a just transition experiment maybe, where you, I don't know, you put in a, a boiler uh, that uses like, um, you know, th solar thermal boiler in a house or where you have, uh, I don't know, um, a microgrid or something like that, then how you then upscale that to the level of the city becomes uh, challenging and, and difficult. Um, I want to give you some examples of things that are being done well when we talk about just transitions and maybe things that are not done so well and they're from different countries. Um, so one example is um, the low income uh, project, a low income project in, uh, in New York, uh, LISC. Um, and they work with what's called the multifamily weatherization program. If you go to the website, you can see what they do. Um, they focus mainly on communities of color uh, and they work with a national program called the multifamily weatherization assistance program. So here you have a national program that's delivered through this charity and non-governmental organization, um, but they don't just deliver it um, in a straightforward way by um, working with individual people who might be eligible. In fact, they involve the whole community uh, through discussion, through, um, through collaboration. Uh, they identify through local leaders, they identify who are the most vulnerable people, how they can be helped in different ways. Um, and in fact, sometimes um, they find tailored solutions. So they are a kind of intermediary between um, that, that group of tenants and the national government. And I think in circumstances where, and that could include the Balkans, where you do have fragmented ownership of, of a particular housing block, where you have very different needs, where you have um, very different uh, technological systems in each flat or each um, domestic situation, uh, what are called trusted intermediaries make a huge difference. And those intermediaries are normally community groups, which is why I really like uh, the concept of uh, the energy community that you have in Croatia. More of those kinds of communities could be drivers of just transitions because they can act as intermediaries between the final citizens or residents and the state that is maybe, maybe has programs, has money to give for um, household and energy improvements or housing energy improvements. Um, another good example for me is the REACH project um, that was based in Croatia and Slovenia. It's from our region. Um, I've put a link to their uh, website. Again, they're a sort of intermediary. Uh, they worked with people who are energy poor. Um, in Croatia, I think they worked in Sisak, uh, Moslavina County. Um, and uh, there's a whole series of projects I think there was another one called Achieve before them. And again, if you see what they did, they acted as a sort of um, essentially a vehicle to deliver customized help for different people, whether it meant, for example, uh, having to um, uh, help with bills, uh, working with a comp district heating company to resolve some of the situation, um, small measures in their home, like radiator foils and so on, or bigger programs. These are all different sorts of tailored uh, help for each, tailored forms of help for each different households. And I think that's that's one of the good ways in which these sort of programs can work. Now I'm going to switch and tell you about some examples that weren't so good. And here again, it's um, the, the combination of structural circumstances and um, local situations that makes what we call just transitions. Um, they, they create effectively resulting in worst, worst outcomes. So um, this example is from Stockholm. I've researched it myself um, and it's in a neighborhood just south of the city center. I should say that all of these examples are examples that I've done research on and published papers on. So I'm just giving you a very, very quick like just a summary of everything that's happened there. But this case in Stockholm was for me quite an interesting one. Um, it happened over a number of years where you had a 
project called um, Grow Smarter, and the project was funded um, by the EU, I believe. And the aim of the project was to improve um, the energy and also overall conditions through um, what we call smart city development projects um, in, uh, in an area of Stockholm that's just south of the city centre called Orsta. I actually, I used to live there, just at the edge of Orsta. Uh, so I, I know the area quite well and I can say that uh, on average it's a poorer district than um, than most of Stockholm, but it's very close to the city centre. So you don't find, nowhere else in Stockholm will you find such a um, relatively poor district being so close to some of the most affluent and desirable parts of the city. So this project came in and essentially the result of what happened there was a process called uh, renovation because they were improving uh, the quality of the housing, but um, the, the housing then became expensive for the people who live there because rents went up. Uh, and uh, some of the costs were also being passed on to the tenants. Um, this is mostly social housing in the area. So effectively people were kicked out um, of, of the district. So they staged an occupation of a theater uh, which you can, I photographed in the background, and you can see there's some graffiti there, which is very unusual uh, for Stockholm. They did all kinds of community organizing. It didn't help them. Um, if you go there now, it's all very nicely renovated, but um, the social structure of the district has changed because the you know poorer people have basically been kicked out. And that's for me an example of something that's not just transition. It's a transition because you've improved the environmental quality of the neighborhood, but also you've um, not ensured the well-being of, of local people. You basically kicked out the people who live there and wealthier people have come in into the district. So um, that's something to avoid. I mean, that's, I should say, it's not necessarily likely in the region that we have, but I think the lack of communication uh, with local residents uh, was very emblematic for me. Uh, this other example, it's not necessarily a just transition example, but it's a kind of a, a transition example. Um, and it's an example where the kinds of decision that you make, um, and I've written a paper about this, which I can send you, um, the kind of decisions that you make in the process of moving from one type of energy system to another, um, it's actually the decisions that you make create uh, what we call a lock-in, they lock you into a particular trajectory, which then results in higher poverty rates uh, than you had before. So it can be, it can actually be um, instructive for what's happening in the region of the Balkans, because it's also in a post-socialist uh, city. And it's uh, in the city of Liberec in, uh, in Czechia or Czech Republic, just in the north of the Czech Republic, um, very close to Germany and and Poland. Um, and this city basically in the early 1990s um, privatized everything that it had. It privatized even the water, I believe. It privatized all the public land. It gave, it sold everything off to private companies. Um, so it privatized also the district heating, uh, as it were, it privatized that to um, give it to private investors. Uh, it had a district heating plant in the city center. Um, there was lots of evidence of corruption in the process and clientelism, so connections with between the companies and the local government. Now, um, in the process that happened, this is the district heating plant in the middle of the city. Um, the, there was also a kind of public-private partnership and an additional plant was built next to the one, to the old one. So essentially both of these were sold to private companies. So you only had, not only did you have the old um, Doplificatia, the kind of district heating, the Plarna as they're called in Czech, but also you had the new one, um, which was a uh, waste to energy plant, both of them being sold to the private investor. But what happened in the 1990s in this city uh, was that there was lots of industry 
that was inherited from communism and that industry closed down. So you had this infrastructure that was supposed to supply the industry with heat. It was there, but there was no industry. There was no one to supply it with. Um, the district heating that enterprise, the whole thing was connected with the municipal government in terms of um, lots of inter intersecting interests. So um, this created a sort of lock-in for the city because they did not know what to do with this capacity. Um, and they had to um, raise the prices of district heating in order to stay solvent. Um, and then people who lived in the city tried to um, remove themselves from the district heating network. Mm. So that's something that you can do in some countries, but not in other countries. So in this instance, you couldn't really do that um, because the, the city put in various laws, which meant that you were locked into um, the system. So essentially you had to pay huge prices, the highest prices for district heating for in the whole of the country were in this city in, in the, and they were going to the private company uh, and people could not leave the system. So it was a kind of lock-in which uh, created lots of problems for many years. And I haven't fo been following in the recent years what actually happened in the end. Um, but for me, it's an example of, again, a transition where if you don't take into account what's going to happen 10, 20, 30 years down the line, you will end up with very unjust outcomes. And for me, the um, I think the example of what's happening now in some countries in the Western Balkan region is that there is investment, lots of investment in gas um, and natural gas, boilers and so on for households and industry. <clears throat> and for me, that's a classic case of a lock-in because uh, 10, 20 years down the line, um, there will be taxes, there will carbon taxes, all kinds of things on this fuel. It will become expensive, but people will be stuck with it. Uh, whereas other places in Western Europe will have been moving away from gas uh, or in America and so on, where they're already doing so. There are cities in North America where there are now bans on new gas boilers and the UK is doing similar thing and so on. So. It's a really, I think it's not a very good idea to be investing in more gas. And that's what, unfortunately, at least some countries in the region here in the Balkans are doing. So um, just like to very summarize very quickly, how do we think of just transitions and more than just a, a slogan, an empty slogan that you, everyone is, will use? Um, they are all about um, thinking with diff working with different actors enabling or different kinds of organizational and stakeholder relations. And intermediaries are very important in the process. Organizations that can mediate between the state, private sector and local residents. It's really important to work with both people and infrastructure. So don't think about um, things as buildings or as objects, but work as residents, work, work with communities as well. And finally, uh, this idea of enclosure, so not closing down particular paths through particular infrastructural investment and particularly through private capital, um, but really opening things up so that you, the state, but also communities have different options available for, uh, for future interventions. Uh, so that's all from me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor. Ви благодарам професоре. Се мислам дека ова со оваа презентација ни не, не мотивира се за повеќе прашања можеби на крајот од настанот. Прашањата кои ги имате можете да ги напишете слободно во чат. За секој говорник ќе може после да, да ви одговори на на прашањето. Нашиот следен панелист е Мелани Мелани Фурлан од Зелената европска, зелената енергетска задруга од Загреб. А тие работат на а, она што го викаме вистинска енергетска демократија и јас би рекол дека во нашиот регион можеби ЗЕС и, и Хрватска можеби се еден 
едно светло што, што може би сјае во моментов што, што ќе ни го покаже патот како понатаму да, да ги имплементираме овие исти мерки кои тие веќе ги, ги имплементираат од минатите седум години. А, само ќе оставам сега на Мелани да таа да ни, да ни ги каже нивните искуства. А, повели Мелани. Thank you, Alexander, for a very nice introduction, uh, and thank you for having me uh, today. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, if something's not working, just please tell me. Uh, I have prepared a brief presentation, so I will share my screen. Okay. I hope you can see it fine. Uh, so, uh, my topic for today is um, the role of citizens in the energy transition as we see it from uh, our perspective and uh, from uh, experience we have as uh, ZES, Green Energy Cooperative here in Croatia. So uh, just to, to start with uh, and to present you briefly who we are, uh, we are a renewable energy cooperative and a social enterprise and uh, we've been actively working in this field uh, since 2013. Uh, at the moment, we have 20 members, uh, but we plan to grow. Uh, we have uh, quite a big por portfolio of projects, uh, most of them uh, coming from um, uh, and in collaboration with uh, European partners, uh, but also uh, we are very active uh, here in the region and uh, we are appreciating opportunities like this to uh, exchange stories and experiences. So uh, what, is, uh, what is our mission in just the three very brief bullets? It's uh, uh, putting citizens in the focus of the energy transition. So we want to see citizens uh, use renewable energy, to invest in re renewable energy, and uh, to have the ecosystem support uh, of all uh, the partners uh, that are necessary in this uh, value chain. So we are, we are mostly focusing on solar as a technology uh, that is uh, well known and uh, quite accessible. So uh, my today's presentation will also focus on uh, solar PV systems uh, and uh, how can they help citizens become an active part of the energy system. So uh, to be maybe more, a bit more general, uh, how can we uh, see, uh, uh, how can uh, uh, citizens be actively uh, involved in uh, energy, local energy communities uh, or cooperatives? Uh, just uh, like uh, uh, that is our case in uh, Croatia. So uh, we are uh, working on education of, and mobilization of local community. Uh, we are putting lots of ep efforts in uh, building strong local partnerships, uh, meaning that we collaborate with uh, local authorities, but also with uh, private companies that are active in energy sector and mainly in solar. So uh, we are uh, very act active in uh, advocating regulatory changes and uh, we also partner up uh, for uh, innovative and uh, research and development projects on the European scale. Uh, we also uh, want to see uh, more of community investments and ownership uh, projects happening in uh, Croatia and our region. So uh, we are uh, encouraging them and uh, mentor uh, organizations that uh, share similar vision and values uh, as, uh, as our cooperative. And uh, we um, encourage citizens to uh, take active role in market activities, such as production of, uh, of uh, renewable energy, uh, energy supply, energy sharing, slash trading, etc. cetera. Um, so just to give you a um, uh, context of uh, what is the solar, uh, solar picture and the situation in Croatia at the moment. Uh, so we are not doing very well uh, in that field. At the moment, we have uh, around 100 megawatts of solar PV installed, uh, and 60% uh, of those is uh, rooftop, uh, rooftop solar, so building integrated. Uh, and uh, this in total uh, meets uh, a bit less than 2% of total household consumption in Croatia. And uh, there is for sure a much, much bigger uh, potential to, uh, to uh, 
has to set a really uh, ambitious goals for the future. Uh, but uh, our government uh, was not so ambitious in that field uh, in, the, in the last strategic documents. So uh, they only envisioned 350 megawatt uh, rooftop solar uh, till 2030. Uh, while we see that uh, it could uh, be uh, around uh, 1.5 gigawatts, uh, much, much bigger. And uh, this is something that uh, we advocate very strongly, both on uh, uh, local and the national level and with, uh, uh, with government. And uh, we want to uh, have this capacity uh, partially owned or fully owned and uh, 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 to, I don't know, to uh, have it, uh, uh, give its benefits, uh, give, it, uh, give its full benefits uh, to the local community and uh, namely to cities and citizens. Uh, so we see citizens as potential investors and uh, one project that we had uh, three years ago and that uh, we share as uh, uh, our, let's say, biggest success uh, in the field of uh, collaborating with the local authorities is a crowd landing for uh, Križevci solar roofs. Uh, so uh, there we installed uh, two uh, relatively small scale uh, PV systems uh, of around uh, uh, 30 kilowatts of capacity. And uh, we had it fully, uh, fully funded uh, by the citizens, by citizen investors, around 80 of them, uh, who uh, got activated and uh, funded uh, uh, the whole the whole investment uh, within 10 days in case of a first campaign and only in two days in the case of a second campaign. And this is something uh, that uh, they are uh, uh, getting return on. So, uh, and it will uh, be fully, fully uh, uh, it will be, uh, be, it will be fully returned in the period of 10 years. And this is something that uh, this project um, we see it's a full, full of potential to be replicated uh, further in Croatia, but also in the in the whole region. Uh, the second big role is uh, citizens as prosumers. So uh, as individual investors in rooftop solar PV for self-consumption of their household. And uh, uh, here we got very inspired with uh, all the research that, he, that has been done uh, on that field uh, on the European scale. And uh, for example, uh, we, we can translate this vision to the Croatian context as well. We want to see one out of two people in Croatia producing their own uh, energy till 2050. Uh, we did uh, local research on that field as well. And it turned out that uh, a huge portion, 90% of citizens uh, who are thinking about uh, making this investment and putting solar on their roof really need administrative and technical support in this process. So uh, that's how we uh, came to the project on the sunny side. It's a relatively new initiative, but uh, it was building up on the many years of uh, experience that we have collaborating with the local authorities and having uh, education and mobilization activities uh, with citizens. Uh, so with, with this initiative, we want to see uh, 1,000 sunny roofs in every city till uh, 2030. Uh, I'm inviting you to uh, see uh, what is it all about on this uh, on this website? But I will also uh, go very briefly through it. Uh, so it, it was uh, officially initiated uh, in July last year with support of uh, EIT Climate Geek, and uh, after that also uh, we got uh, additional support from Raiffeisen Bank in Croatia as a commercial partner. And now we are looking to enlarge uh, that pool of partners as well to really have uh, a strong impact uh, and uh, regenerate the boost uh, to this, uh, to this uh, market of uh, small solar. And uh, the, in the initial phase of the project in September last year, we had a good energy tour. 
this was mostly uh, educational and the promotional activities around uh, not only solar, but uh, about renewable energy uh, in general and its application uh, in, uh, in households. So uh, we, um, we visited around 10, 11 cities uh, in the course of four weeks. And uh, we really got uh, a huge, huge inspiration from talking to all the people who want to see a real change happening in their city and uh, uh, to uh, use this uh, uh, green technology that is, uh, that is uh, widely available to give boost to their local ec uh, economy, to jobs, but also to have uh, to, and to achieve uh, savings uh, for themselves, for their household. So in October, we launched uh, a digital tool uh, website on the sunny side. Uh, and uh, through that tool, uh, we invite citizens uh, to uh, ask any question and to seek for the technical and then administrative support uh, in the every step from uh, uh, initial planning uh, to installation of their small scale solar CST, the solar PV system. And uh, uh, in parallel to that, we are uh, talking and uh, negotiating deals with uh, local solar companies uh, to get the best price and, and assure uh, quality service uh, to our customers or, or to the citizens in general. So uh, in the last six months, uh, we got to some really impressive numbers, and this is only giving us uh, uh, the, uh, high high motivation to to continue and uh, to uh, to aim for even higher goals and to reach uh, more and more citizens uh, in uh, in the following months. So uh, till now we have uh, more than. Uh, 750 expressions of interest from citizens uh, collected through this platform, but also many more uh, through, other, through other channels. For example, we have more than 3,000 members now uh, active in our uh, Facebook community, Solar Club. And uh, what is also very important uh, to, uh, um, so all of this can, uh, can really be possible, uh, it's the regulatory framework, and what the institutions are doing to encourage uh, citizens to become prosumers. And uh, I will I just put here uh, briefly what does, uh, how does this uh, framework look like in Croatia? Uh, he, on the household level, we are talking about the net metering uh, that uh, really enabled uh, citizens to have a return on the, uh, their investment uh, quite fast uh, within uh, six or to eight years uh, in, uh, in Croatia. Uh, and this is something that really unlocked uh, all, the, all the potential uh, that, uh, that, like, we can, that we see and that we want to reach and fulfill uh, in, the, in the next 10 years and more. So that was all from my side. Uh, I'm here if you have any questions. I try to be brief uh, and you can really reach me like anytime you have uh, more questions about uh, what are all of the activities that we do here on the, on the local level and in collaboration with the cities. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that uh, we feel like it's very, very important to, to uh, initiate um, uh, trustworthy and uh, uh, strong partnership collaboration uh, with local partners uh, and uh, not only local authorities, as someone who uh, very often have trust of citizens, but also local NGOs, local companies, the whole local community uh, to really like look into the needs of that community and uh, bring the best solutions uh, uh, for them. Okay, great. Uh, um, thank you for your, for your presentation. Voretke prodožan sa na makedonski, ako može. Ти благодарам Мелани за одличната презентација. Мислам дека добивме слика а, како работите во Хрватска. Се надавам дека, дека со почетокот на работата наша и се разбира на рес фондацијата од Белград, 
тоа ќе се расшири низ регионот. Веќе остваруваме со работ како кака како организации, се надевам дека ќе го подигнеме нивото во иднина, да направиме поголеми промени. Исто така, сега сакам да го најавам и нашиот последен значи, говорник, Стеван Војасинович од Одрес Фондейшн, со неговата тема кој сам ќе ја каже. Повели, Стеван. Благодарим, хвала, thank you. I suppose that's what we're in English as well. Um, thanks so much for having me. It's great to meet you guys. And uh, given that it's already, I'm the last speaker, or at least in the structured part of the presentation, the good news is I don't have a, a long slideshow. So I'll try and contribute to the discussion with a few points, which I hope will be compatible with what my predecessors have said already. I said in the introduction or whenever we exchanged emails in preparation for this, I said, how many Ds in energy democracy, I believe. Yeah? And uh, I'm basically using this as a teaser. I will split my presentation into two sections. In the beginning, I will just say a few words about some key Ds, which are good for organizing our thinking about these topics and energy transition generally in terms of policy making as well. And then I will add a few more Ds, which are you know, my own invention that you won't find them in the literature on just transition, etc. It's just kind of my own idea about spicing up the discussion. And then hopefully from that, I will draw some useful conclusions and maybe messages that can serve as a challenge for all of us to have a, a fruitful, useful discussion. So the first three Ds, some of you have heard about already, uh, decarbonization, decentralization and digitalization. Aren't they lovely words with Asians all over the place? So, decarbonization, decentralization, and digitalization. Um, I'm not going to explain this because I think this group of people understands what these terms depict and what they describe. But I will just spend a few minutes describing a few challenges associated with each one of these, which I find are less visible, less understood, less clearly identified in our neck of the woods, our region, the so-called Western Balkans, or however you want to call us. So the first one, decarbonization. I think much too often this discussion ends up being centered on the energy sector alone. I think when we talk about decarbonization, what's lacking in our, in, when I say our, I've, I find myself discussing these issues with fellow advocates of energy transition. But I think we as a group, when we interact with the people from outside of this group, especially with decision makers, I think we should make a stronger effort in stressing that this is about much more than energy. You know, the energy sector alone clearly is the main focus. I don't mean to underestimate this, but if we're going to have things like carbon neutral societies, like we have, you know, our governments have signed up, whether through EU membership already, or whether through such international agreements as the Sofia Summit and our Western Balkans Green Deal for the Western Balkan, whatever it's called. Basically, we are committed to a trajectory which is directed towards climate neutrality. Clearly, that's going to mean more than decarbonizing energy. And I think that's, that's just one thing that I, I, I think in our region, we cannot go wrong if we continue to repeat this, that we need people from the transport sector to join us, we need people from the agriculture sector. To, we need people from the ministries of economy, ministries of finance. So I think it's safe to say that in our region, we would help the, these processes if we advocate for a, an inclusive discussion of energy transition that involves informed participants, not just from the energy sector. For whatever reason, let's not waste time whether this is something you know, it's obviously a generalization, you know, but I think to a certain extent in our region, the energy is a kind of a sector of its own. And it's been in existence for a very long time as a kind of independent thing that, you know, there are people in charge of making decisions about our energy. And I think we should do our part in democratizing this and, and integrating many different sectors into the discussion. That basically means I'm just kind of reminded by my notes. We need to understand that this is more than just energy. We need to change the way of our way of life. 
Next, D is decentralization. I think for our region, it's worthwhile recognizing that our political traditions are such that perhaps we could do a service to energy transition, energy democracy, by again, reminding over and over and over again, everybody that we speak to about the fact that decentralization is a necessity for the success of the energy transition, not least of all for the many reasons that my predecessors in this group have already described. The way that energy is produced, the way that energy is used, and the change that's ahead of us means that basically, you know, we talk about just transition, energy transition, we have terminology for this, but it's essentially change. And for many people outside of our communities, it's easier to just say, here, one of the changes that will happen that are very inevitable, inevitable is that rather than having few centralized places in our countries where energy is produced in a very controlled and centralized manner, such as the thermal power plants that we inherited from the, from the obsolete energy systems of the past, we need to recognize that this change means um, decentralization of the way that energy is produced and used. And I'm not going to go too deep into this because I think especially um, the presentation from the Zez, the Zelena Energetska Zadruga, whatever, the translation doesn't really matter, but um, I think that was already illustrated. So the second D is decentralization. The last D of the familiar Ds that drove me to say how many Ds in energy democracy is digitalization. And I think that doesn't need too much explaining. The, we are basically having at our disposal the tools and the technologies to accommodate the changes that I've already described. The, the way that renewable energy, the pattern of energy production from renewable sources obviously differs significantly from what we are familiar with in terms of the coal-based systems or fossil fuels that we have used to date. Then again, the patterns of energy use are changing as well. Nevertheless, with democratization, decentralization, et cetera, et cetera, we are actually finding ourselves that these can be organized in a very user-friendly manner, thanks to digital solutions, thanks to smarter grids, which actually allow us to have more and more of our energy systems based on renewable energies, accommodating all of the limitations, basically disarming all the advocates of whatever, let's stick to fossil fuels or you know, not just coal, but like you was said before, you know, let's avoid you know, fossil gas. I like to call it fossil gas rather than natural gas. If people in our region, or at least where I'm from, they say prirodni gas. No, this is fossil gas. So just a reminder that when, when we're talking about decarbonization, etc., etc. So decarbonization, decentralization, digitalization. Those three, I think, make sense and they are interconnected, mutually reinforcing, etc., etc., etc. Having said that, and this is something that we have, you know, these three Ds are something that in a different, you know, from a variety of different regional settings across Europe, we are in Europe, whether or not we are member states of the European Union or not. These are the experiences that we have access to a variety of, you know, critical success factors from different regions in Europe, trying to overcome their dependency on fossil fuels and, and achieving a swift and effective energy transition. However, now I get to a bit where I add a few extra Ds where I actually want to perhaps, I don't know, maybe vent a little bit of my own frustration, um, which is a personal view of where we are actually falling short of what is needed. And when I say we, I mean, we primarily, the, this is a discussion about our region, but I don't think this is limited to the region. I think some of these points will be valid elsewhere as well. Number one, I find that for many of these regions that were at the center of people's attention, when we talk about just transition, energy transition, support mechanisms, you know, such as a variety of different initiatives which are finding now being replicated from the experience of being applied in the EU member states, now being also replicated to the Western Balkans, similar to the coal regions in transition platform, which was basically set up as a kind of knowledge platform for coal regions to exchange experiences 
on how they can diversify their regional economies and build a future which is independent and, and uh, sustainable, independent from fossil fuels and, and sustainable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm saying that this is all going too slow. We are spending far too much time talking about it and not enough time doing it. Um, the reason I say this is because when you look at, when you actually um, look at the research that has been done already, or if you actually take for us in our, in, in our region, we're a small place geographically, it's not difficult at all. And, and you know, we have friends and family. It's not really that difficult to gain even anecdotal evidence of what actually happens in Bitola, in Obrenova, in Tuzla, et cetera, et cetera. Such is the environmental, you know, impact of these energy systems that we need to overcome. Such is the economic disaster, the economic dead end of coal already, even though our region is not yet it's, it's still being given the kind of space. We're still not charged for our carbon emissions. You know, our, so there's, we're still not even close to actually paying the full cost of, of, of what these systems actually do to the environment, to our public health. And in actual fact, due to the, you know, the structure of the industry, even to our, the rest of our economy, coal is getting... You know, the, its quality is is gradually, de, you know, worse and worse. It's getting more and more difficult to get to it. You need to dig deeper. I'm not an engineer, so I use this language, which hopefully is more user friendly. But it's getting more and more expensive, less and less uh, rational to to continually rely on these uh, inherited systems. Whilst this is going on, and whilst most of our research and whilst most of the policy making discussions center around how do we cater for the number of employees, number of jobs that will be lost by the closure of the coal industry, et cetera, et cetera, there is a, I find a quiet, um, there is another process happening behind, behind the scenes that doesn't really get the same level of recognition. There is a degree of depopulation from these areas because policy making is not proactive because we are running late with solutions, especially amongst young generations. You know, youth are in, in our neck of the woods. There isn't really a strong tradition of involving young people in policy discussions, in democratizing, you know, decision-making processes, in, you know, get, giving them a voice in long-term economic planning, de local development planning, et cetera, et cetera. Being alienated as they are, many of these people, many of the most precious members of these local communities, th those entrepreneurial people who have ideas about how to build the future, which does not involve relying on coal industries or fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera, they end up moving to Belgrade, to Skopje, to Sarajevo. They move away from these places. And, and gradually, we end up depleting the social capital of the regions in which we are trying to build a sustainable future. So I'm trying to add a sense of urgency here. So the D that I want to introduce now is depopulation. Another re sort of factor that I want to put into this is the fact that oftentimes these industries are male dominated industries in our neck of the woods. I don't know about the rest of Europe, but some research that I was able to access, you know, this is a, so, you know, Rudnitsi is a Mushka industry, if that's a legitimate way to say it, you know, especially the ones that I've seen. And what happens, often not even noticed, is that there is high unemployment rates for women in local communities, they, they, you know, they'll have a few jobs here and there in support services, etc. But very few employment opportunities, and and obviously for youth. So these these factors add to decision making at you know even at the most basic community level, where people are making calculated decisions about their future. And actually, those with ideas, with professional you know biographies that can get them jobs elsewhere, with education they go elsewhere and, 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 and they don't stay. So I want to put this into perspective. Uh, we are discussing the future of these regions without the people who are supposed to be that future. So that's, that's why I, I felt I wanted to introduce this uh, D for depopulation. Then I wanted to introduce D for democracy because we're talking about energy democracy. You know, in an ideal world, we would be like very democratic societies and we would be presented with the challenge of energy transition or change to renewable energy, but our democratic trans 
traditions, institutions, capacities would allow us to, you know, consider the change that we need to undergo in a participative manner, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, you know, if you want, and you have to quote me, quote me on this, that's not the case. You know, we don't have a, obviously, again, I'm, I'm generalizing, but, you know, we have inherited a political culture of centralized decision making, of top down decision models. You have people in these places waiting for instructions from Belgrade, from Sarajevo, from Skop, you know, some people are waiting to hear from the, you know, headquarters of the public electric utility company on what's going to happen next. You know, this is very often, you know, local initiatives, local entrepreneurship, you know, ideas about di diversification or whatever else you would want to promote are actually stifled by the fact that the institutional setup is such that it doesn't actually promote that kind of local level ownership and initiative. So democratization, yes, the more we need it, but uh, we need to, I think, recognize that it's a challenge rather than to assume that it's a given, that it's already there. And then finally, I want to say um, decisiveness. And I think that's the D with which I want to conclude because I'm aware of the fact that there is a limit to the time for my presentation. What happens in this, against this background, against, you know, I think um, insufficient dynamics, I'm searching for words which start with D, because we're not dynamic enough. I'm, I'm kind of being self-critical here. And I'm also saying this about us as a group, not in this meeting, but actually about advocates of, of a swift and, and effective energy transition. We need to, I think, think about how we can achieve the changes that we advocate, but in a more dynamic fashion. We don't have all the time in the world. What happens against this background in our region, you know, you will speak to policymakers, you will speak to mayors, you will speak to a great many people who know the, you know, what are the right things to say, but they don't do them. You know, there is indecision. So that again, these, these, the latter part of the D's that I introduced, they interact between themselves to actually bring about a situation where there is this culture of delaying, you know, something that's perceived as potentially, you know, problematic decision making, et cetera, et cetera. And with this in mind, I want to say that for us in our region, I think it's perhaps useful to remind ourselves of the fact that we also underwent economic transition. When we're talking about transition, we also went through this period at different stages of time, I don't know, 90s, early 20s, but, you know, the rest of Central Europe did it as well in Eastern Europe. When you talk about economic transition, the one thing, the one lesson that you will hear from each and every experience of every country in Central and Eastern Europe is that don't waste time. You, you know, the shorter, you, the more, the quicker you make it, the less painful it is, the less stressful it is, the quicker you get to the all the variety of different positives that make the change worthwhile. So don't prolong it, don't extend it, don't do exactly what we are doing in our region, I'm afraid. And, and this is, I think, a rhetoric sentence for the end. So I would basically like to say, maybe quote Nike at the end, you know, let's try our best, you know, not to talk about it that much, let's do it, you know. And in that sense, I think there is a real space for everyone to be entrepreneurial about this. And when I say this, I mean, you know, sometimes you say, oh, that's the job of the business sector. There'll be entrepreneurs in these regions who will develop small and medium-sized enterprises. They will pick up the jobs that we lose in the, in whatever, the coal affected regions, et cetera, et cetera. Or whatever, it's always somebody else. Actually, I think there is room for everybody to be extremely entrepreneurial about it. One of the recent events that I attended on energy communities, I loved the, one of the conclusions there is, there is no use in waiting for an enabling environment. What you find, and I don't know, I'm especially keen to learn whether this is something that was the experience in Croatia with Zez. You know, you don't wait for the enabling environment. You do it and you enable. <laughs> the, what do entrepreneurs do? If, if people waited in every sector for the enabling environment, nothing would ever, there'd be no change. So let's be entrepreneurial about energy transition. And my final D is do it, just do it. That's where I say I'll finish with the Nike slogan and I'll say, you know, 
as important as it is to talk about it, to include people, to have a, a an inclusive process that leaves no one behind, it is as important to support the entrepreneurs amongst our ranks, whether they are researchers, policymakers, whether they are local government officials, whether they are trade union leaders, whether they are women who have hair salons in Kolubara, Basin, whether they are young people who are thinking about whether or not to leave Lazarevac or Tuzla and go elsewhere, you know, or in, we really need to be entrepreneurial and, and perhaps more um, brave about actually challenging ourselves and the people we speak to about the pace of this change. And I think we're running late. And with that, I, I will stop. Let's just do it. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, nice wrap up at the end. Uh, <laughs> Ти благодарам, Стеван. А, сега а, би сакал, значи, се разбира дека ќе продолжиме со дискусијата понатаму, а, но би сакал да, а, да, да ви улачам на уште еден говорник кој го имаме овде, а, а тоа е значи, а, еден уметнички говорник кој ни говори преку слика и преку а, цртање. А, неговиот концепт се вика а, Але Джос ен Лисенс ен Джос, Uh, и можете да видите, тој, тој е инспириран значи, од, нашите, од, од нашите панелисти, од нивните говори и uh, прави графички, значи, графички интерпретација на целиот настан. Uh, се разбира, ова ќе можете да го видите после настанот, а uh, ќе го искористиме и да го вклопиме во нашето видео од настанот. Uh, да му се заблагодарам на Але значи, за неговата работа, на вистина прекрасно и интересно. Uh, сега во продолжение би сакал uh, да го вклучам... Uh, Значи, Христијан Станојевиќ, кој е наш стучен соработник, исто така е млад новинар, кој истражува во, 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 во овие теми на, на животната средина, во поново време нормално и во енергетиката. Би сакал да го вклучам него со прашања од чатот, може би ќе ни прочиташ некое прашање или некое подготвено прашање од предходно, Христијан, повеле. Така, Александар. Моментално на чатот се уште нема пистинато пораки, може би следбениците не се навикнати да поставуваат напишани прашања, може би сака да се включат, ќе ги включиме ако не е и подоцна. И уште еднаш ја користам приликата да ги повикам сите следбеници, учесници на овој вебинар, своите прашања да ги постават во делот на Q&A. Uh, и така полесно, многу по-директно ќе ги поставиме до нашите панелисти. Тоа што ја би сакал да им го поставам uh, како прашање на, на сите панелисти е улогата на самите граѓани. Uh, Предходно uh, се спроведе една кампања, енергијата во рацете на граѓаните. Значи, ние може да говориме за регулативи, за промени во, во системите, но колко е клучно uh, здружувањето на граѓаните, бидеќи ние и јас се, себе си се сметам како дел од тој колектив, што можеме ние да направиме, да речам, во една зграда, во една насоба, во една улица, за да добиеме поголема контрола над енергетските ресурси и како може да ги оствариме овие цели. Повелете. Значи, според мене основното праша, и сакам да отворам малко и повеќе дискусија тука, е политичко. Тука, значи, не, не сакаме да зборуваме за тоа, но основната работа е пак се враќаме на политиката. И тука е јавната политика, се разбира и дневната политика. Се радам дека е во решто одговорив на македонски, тоа малко се збуни, за тоа еден момент не бев сигурен, некако по-природно ми дојде. Но... Значи, во сите овие земји, еве посебно во Западниот Балкан, е потребна многу силна политичка воја за да се излезе од сегашната ситуација, да се излезе од ситуацијата во смисла на решително справување со фосилните горива. Тоа е основниот проблем според мене. И, и тука треба најмногу да работиме, да ги поддржиме тие што се да ги притиснеме, но и да ги поддржиме на извесен начин тие што ги донесуваат одлуките, да донесат решителни одлуки. Има, имаме една ситуација каде што се чини дека некои одлуки се донесуваат, но потоа испаѓа дека, дека не се донесени. 
Ispored mene osnovni od problem što će nastane u naredni od period, da sakam da konkretiziram diskusijata malko, je okolo gasot, okolo, kako što mnogo dobro reče prethodni odgovornik, um, apsolutno nešto što ne je prirodno, fosilni od gas. Um, znači, srednji od horizont, za, posebno za zapadni od Balkana, je da se od, oslobodimo od toj energenci. Uh, Ako ne go storime toa, mi se čini, eva kaj će kažem, v Britanija pred pet golini je bil vojden projekt, v koj što, koj što beše za, za gas. Ne li? I si te kažuva, gas od kje ni bide, um, energens od na koj što kje mora da se oslonime v ovaj moment. Drugi opciji nema da ima. Nema da ima izbor. Enostavno, kje završime tamo. Bide i kine, kje so, nema da ima jaglen, nafsat na kje se reducira, ki završime na gas. Sega zboruvame, evo i v Britaniji, evo i v drugi zemi, za kompletno oslobodovanje, za nekoristenje na gas od kako tako narečeno tranzicijsko gorivo, toliko kako čisto fosilno gorivo, ko što vlegova v, v ista, isti od koške, što treba da vide, v koš od na fosilnite goriva. Tukaj mi se čini je najgolemata in najtežka ta odluka, što treba sega da se donese. Da, ne, da se poditno prestane so forsiranje to na gas kako energent v sito ovije zemi. Celata ta obsesija so gasovodi, so novi rešenji in tako na tamu, gledame v strategijite, gasni centrali in tako na tamu. To je mene najmnogo me plaši, to se potrošeni pari za što odat za nikade. Ako sakrame vistinska pravedna tranzicija, treba da razmislime kako v ovije zemi in tukaj, ki go elektrificira be sektorot. To je osnovna ta ravota. Mora da posebno ne, ne samo industrijata, no i domakistvata i komercijalniot sektor mora da se elektrificirati. V smislu da se golemi potrošovačkata na električna energija, koja što električna energija može da se obezbedi preko od obnovljivi izvori na energija. Im, ima poveki modaliteti i druga ta ne se razbira drugi od osnovne modalitete energetska ta efikasnost. To se teški i ne, lesni, ne samo teški, nego tuku i a, kompleksni rešenja, no drug, drug izbor nema v momentov. A, I no, ne, se razbira, zajedno so njih učestvo v poširoki pazari, a, da se može bi napušti idejata, da ka mora cela ta energija da se obezbedova v natrevo graniste na vse koja država, Nije sme povrzani v evropski prostor, nema potreba se koja država sama da proizvedova. Vidite, tukaj se otvore i golemo to prašenje na hidro, što isto je problematičen izvorna energija. Um, razmislovanje za fleksibilnost, za energetski zajednici, vse to to, što vsi da tije dodatni rešenja. Tukaj jaz mislim, da ka je jednineta, tukaj se golemite prašenje i se nadevam, da ka ima poveke diskusije na, na ta tema. Da li može mi Milan ili Stevan bi sakali da dopomnat? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I would say that it's uh, very important that uh, local communities recognize that they have a say in uh, shaping their future, in uh, shaping uh, policies, not only on a local level, but uh, uh, even on national level. So they really have a say and they have to recognize that they can and should have power in uh, in creating these decisions and in uh, taking a uh, pathway. Uh, and uh, it, there are many, many ways that uh, they can really uh, activate themselves and uh, uh, give contribution, whether it's uh, promoting, advocating, educating, uh, investing, uh, changing their own habits. Uh, there's really like, whole uh, pool of ideas and options. They just, uh, what they should not do is just sit and wait and complain. And uh, this is a whole paradigm that needs to be changed, I guess, uh, uh, not, not only in uh, our region, but, but broader. Because people, they just don't recognize that they have a power and they don't recognize they have a say in shaping their own future. And they're just waiting for someone else to make decisions, decisions for them. Uh, whether it's uh, using that, uh, fossil fuels, uh, whether it's uh, transition to, to clean energy. Bi dodali da ka 
Практично проблемите со кои што се случуваме тука во Македонија се слични и на секаде, на Балканот, и во Србија, и во Босна, и во Албанија, и во Косово. Стеван, што мислиш ти како да се решат овие предизвици? I would agree that I think we have a joint understanding, shared understanding of the fact that for a great many citizens, they actually underestimate the power that they have. You know, on one hand, let, let, rather than the, you know, talk about it in theoretical terms, I'd like to use this example of what's happening with the air pollution crisis across our region, because I think that's a shared issue that many of us can, can you know, already know about. You know, air pollution has finally been understood as affecting so directly the, you know, the health of you know, millions of people that... You know, I'll, I'll give an example from Serbia, but I think it's illustrative of how our political elites, because our political elites, unfortunately, you know, share a lot of these shortcomings that I've told, talked about in terms of the, the way they make decisions. We went last year when we had the, the so-called heating season, whatever, from October to the air pollution crisis happens in winter because of, primarily because of heating. Amongst and, and what happened was, we started off with breaking all world records of you know how bad our air was in say october and we found that at least here in serbia we have i'm not going to name them but we have these political figures who are on tv 24 7 on all channels etc etc claiming that this is like absurdity we don't have air pollution this is the same air pollution that we always used to have we don't have the same industry. We don't have, you know, where is this coming from? You're just imagining things. Then three or four, you know, protests later, and I was, at, I attended some of these. They were, not, you know, didn't really gather more than maybe two or 3,000 people in Belgrade. That's not really a great deal, you know. But the rhetoric changed. So maybe there is some pollution, but we'll see, we'll do something about transport, let's subsidize hybrid vehicles, etc., etc., etc. We kept on breaking records about air pollution. The next march in Belgrade was 6,000 people. There is an, all of a sudden, there is a meeting of the extraordinary session of governments, which is dedicated just to designing emergency measures for protecting the quality of air in Serbia. Let's not get into the quality of their measures. They suck. I mean, just to de demystify what they... But they felt the need to say to the public that they at least heard that there is an issue and that they are attending to it. And if you think about it, that's what democracy is all about. We need to be more proactive about articulating what we want. I'll give another example because I just can't resist. The discussion about reliance on coal by the electric power company of Serbia, which is probably the biggest company in Serbia and by definition one of the most powerful organizational entities that there is here. You know, I was in a in a in, a, in an event which probably there was about fifty people. And there was some people from EPS from Electric Power Company, and they were kind of implying that by virtue of speaking badly of coal, that somehow some of the participants are endangering the future of EPS. And I literally said that, that I, I asked for you know microphone and I said that there's been a confusion in this meeting, the people from EPS, because this is Javno Preduzeche, this is a public company. Maybe they didn't understand, but this is my company. <laughs> when you say public company, I am a member of the public. And actually, by not planning for you know phasing coal out, you are ruining my company. And all of a sudden, a whole bunch of people, the discussion changed. And I think we need to, like what I said earlier, let's just do it. Let's not wait for somebody else to do it. Let's be brave, proactive, and advocate, you know, in whatever we do. So the, the, the more, the braver we are. I also want to say something else. The wonderful thing about our region, however slow it is, is that if you, if you begin looking beyond the borders of these countries that we live in, you find that for every argument that people have for not doing anything, actually there is a, not a counter argument, but there is a, an example to show. So for instance, I would think that this is really, you know, I find it hard to believe that Croatia cannot do better on renewables, on solar, right? Actually, 
our entire region is this is a disgrace on how little energy, solar energy we use, given our climate where we are, the potential of this resource. But still, just the Zez experience helps us all because I've used it in, even though I don't know the colleagues, I, you know, only now we meet Melanie, but it's important that we all just do it because every step that we take breaks, the, demystifies these, you know, scenarios of let's just, you know, pretend that nothing's going on and maybe we'll survive. So I'll stop there. Добро, че гледно дека ја развивме дискусијата и веќе пристигнуваат и прашања. Првото прашање го имаме од Дејан Димитровски, упатена до професорот Стефан Божаровски. Како тој гледа на енергетските заедници во Македонија? Дали можноста на формирање и функционирање е пристапна или треба уште многу време да помине за да ја добиеме оваа можност? Професора, повелете. Ова е малку надвор од мојата областна истражување. Јас не ги знам точно ам, правните пречки што постојат во моментов, а предпоставам дека има е, одредени пречки од таа природа и што е веројатно исто така е, ситуацијата. Сигурно многу од вас подобро го знаат ова. Ам, ке има проблем со предавање на, со енергијата, едноставно вклучување во мрежата и се не знам колку се спремни операторите тоа да го да го вклучат кај нив. На страна од тоа, значи, еве да речеме да ги, да ги тренаме на страна правните и техничките пречки, јас мислам дека, дека овај, постојат можности во одредени локации, каде што има други форми на, на заедници од земјоделска или локална природа, но дури и во градовите, да се изгради врзни в енергетска заедница. Значи, треба да се искористат, мислам, нека имаат тука најмногу можност, а, ситуациите кај што постои веќе некој вид на, на функционирање локално. А, доколку се тргнат тие правни пречки, а, јас сум убеден дека и доколку има соодветна помош од некој исто, како што зборував предходно, интермедијарни организации, јас сум убеден дека може многу брзо да се случи да има експлозија од овој вид на организирање и ако го земемо предвид ам, искуството на еве не баш земите во регионот, но на централно европските земји. Јас сум вклучен во еден проект за енергетски заедници, кој што главно работиме во Полска и тамо има страшно голем број на енергетски заедници. Имаше мала промена на легислативата, имаше... Ам, се отворија можности некои од нив не се вклучени во, во мрежата, исто и во Чешка е слична ситуација и многу брзо имаше експлозија. Така што јас сум оптимист, меѓутоа не сум сигурен какви се техничките и правните можности. Се надам дека ќе се изврши притисок за тие да се оптимиз, оптимизираат за овој вид на организации. Може некој од вас повеќе знае за тоа да ќе може да прокоментира. Така, едно дополнително опрашање, упатено до Мелани Фурлан. Како се решени издружувањата за собствено производство на енергија во колективното домување? Се поставува на Хрватска. Повели Мелани. Uh, yeah, I was I was just typing the question in the, in the chat and uh, it seems that I just sent it to... Uh, to Stevan, I guess, instead of uh, all. <laughs> so uh, this is unfortunately still not possible uh, in Croatia, the collective self-consumption. But uh, this is something uh, that uh, has been envisioned uh, in, within a regulatory, within uh, uh, a new framework that's being shaped uh, for the law on uh, electricity market in Croatia. And uh, we really hope that we will see this uh, in place. Uh, this regulatory framework uh, from uh, from this fall, and we are very hopeful about that because this is really a huge pot potential for uh, uh, for people living in uh, in uh, apartments uh, in uh, in uh, collecting this uh, in the in the buildings in the flats to uh, to have a collective self consumption uh, as a way to become uh, owners of their solar system, uh, solar system and uh, use the, that electricity. At the moment, this is yeah, still not possible.
Би сакал сега баше да ги информирам нашите значи, учесници моментално и панелистите дека всушност и, и во Македонија во, последните, во последниот период значи, е формирана веќе енергетска задруга, која се уште значи, ги истражува можностите. Оно што го спомна професорот, значи, нас ни е потребно истражување на, на регулативата и се разбира незина, незина адаптација и промена за овозможување на, на овие форми на здружување, на здружено производство. И се надеваме дека во наредниот период, значи, а, оние што сме и овде како организации и како, и како лични се пример, како професорот, можеме да оствариме понатамошна соработка на оваа тема. А, би го кажал ова и како, како заклучок значи, од, од, од целиот настан. И се надевам дека ке се најде значи, и полит, политичка воля, која повеќе пати ја спомнавме на настанот, за овие промени да ги, да ги реализираме. Uh, исто така би, би, би сакал да најавам дека се надевам на еден uh, настан во живо во, во близко време uh, од истива организација, значи, ја и официјално ги поканувам и ЗЕС и РЕС Фондейшн, нормални професорот кој веќе е овде во Скопје <laughs> периодов, значи, можеме и да се состанеме на некој хибриден или пак настан во живо, каде што ќе можеме нормално по-лесно по да ги дискутираме овие, овие uh, прашања кои ги загонетнавме на овој настан. Понатаму би, би сакал да, да, да продолжам и за, за самиот проект кој го имаме со Зелената Европска фондација, кој веќе трае трета година на, на оваа тема, се извинам, четврата година на оваа тема. А, би се заблагодарил на, на ГЕФ на можноста да работиме како нивни партнери овде во Македонија. А, би сакал исто да, да ве посетам дека можете да посетите нивната веб страна, исто така и нашата веб страна, за да видите што работиме во последниот период. А, а, од што би истакнал дека а, значи, нашата поголем, еден поголем а, проект кој го работевме беше а, превед, превод на македонски на а, последните два а, журнали на, на Европската фондација и на нивниот журнал, значи за нивниот европски журнал. А, можете да го видите исто во чат а, линкот до, до журналот и се разбира на нашите веб страни на изгесенци.мк и на gf.eu можете да, да ја видите по-детално нашата соработка во, во, а, години, во, во вре, времескиот период кој доаѓа. Ако панелистите немаат уште некое обраќање, значи јас би го, би го затворил веќе настанот и благодарам на, на учесниците кои гледам имавме денеска интересно и од регионата, и од Европа имавме учесници кои не слуша. А, ние веќе го најавме како дека е на англиски, со симултан превод и се надеваме дека вака широки гости ки имаме и панелисти значи, и на следните настани кои следат. Ве покануам значи, да ја следите нашата фейсбук страна и се разбира да се приключувате на настаните и на активностите кои ги имаме. Ви благодарам на сите.